All right, we are ready to go. So far, now, now my kids did all reach out to me. I know it's Father's Day today, which is, which is a great thing. But one of the best things about this morning, before church, I was sitting up here in that chair back there and just watching and listen to everybody carry on the conversations and, and hug and laugh and giggle and stuff. That is incredible. It is great to see, um, you know, especially some of the familiar faces. I'm not, I'm not going to say old faces. I'm using the word familiar faces. But it's, it's fantastic to see everybody start coming back to church and just being excited to be here and excited to see everybody uh, who, who's members of the church here. That is, that is a great, great thing. So first and foremost, we do want to recognize the fathers today. So if you're a father or a grandfather, if you are able, I know you just sat down, right? uh, please stand up. Father, grandfather, I know we got a couple already standing up. I'm standing up already. Good job, fathers. All right, go ahead and sit down. We have some of the best fathers in the, probably the world. I'm going to go with the whole world. We have some great, just some great individuals who, you know, love God and lead their families um, towards God. And the things that happen at this church, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it is, is due to the fathers. Now, the mothers as well, but we are recognizing the fathers today. Um, but it is, it is great to, to see the fathers in this, in this church and what they've, what they've accomplished um, like I said, we, we are truly blessed in the size of church we have to have as great of men as we have here. It is, it is thoroughly impressive to, uh, to see that. Uh, a few things I would like to go over. We are on Tuesday, if you are able, a ceiling painting day. Ceiling painting day. So, not necessarily in here. Well, actually, the back of the church as well as the hallway. If, if you saw, um, I would like to point out, uh, actually, uh, Gary and Nicole are not in here right now. But let me tell you something. Those, and also, Alan Sharon got here a little late today. We had our, our garage done just uh, a couple months ago. They tore down all the popcorn ceiling and then put up whatever it is and then painted it. It was messy. I can't even, it was still messy in our garage. And uh, I can't even fathom what it looked like. I didn't even show up because Alan sent out an email. If you don't have to be up here, don't come up. But I can't even imagine how messy it was out there. But hard work um, from especially those two families that uh, got, it, got it cleaned up and, and prepared for church. But Tuesday, um, we are going to have a painting day um, to paint the ceiling and then just the back ceiling in the, uh, in the auditorium here as well. And um, so if you are able, I would assume Larry's got to bring me to the doctor in the morning, 11-ish. Okay, 9 o'clock. If you are able um, and able to do that, you know, if you could show up, that'd be, that'd be fantastic to do. Also, a couple things going on, too. Um, we're going to ask for some extra prayers this week uh, for some of our kids going to youth camp. So <laughs> we've never had some cheering. Like, that's great. That's, I am excited to see. I'm, I'm, I am pumped that you guys are pumped to go to a camp. I uh, didn't get to go last year, but once again, we're trying to get back to normal. Um, these kids that go to camp, they come back, and they are absolutely pumped for Jesus. Um, Amen. You know, it's, it, is a, it is a great, great thing. My, my son-in-law uh, gets to lead the kids as they go down there. And if, if you've ever met my son-in-law, you think they have energy? My son-in-law will run circles around those guys. He, uh, he's got energy for energy, no doubt about that. But, uh, but uh, they always do an incredible job down there. Um, also, next Sunday, so we're moving up to deacons meeting next Sunday. And this is our first actually in-person meeting uh, for a deacon's meeting next Sunday, immediately following church. It should take 45 minutes to an hour. We're going to do things just a little bit different next week. Uh, so if you are a deacon, you're able to stay next Sunday at right after church, and uh, we'll get that going. Also, keep in mind uh, prayers for our sports camp. I'm sorry, sports and art camp. So ages 5 through 12, and it is starting on June 28th. 
So once again, if you have kids in your neighborhood, more kids the better. I mean, we just, you know, bring as many kids as you can. If you need some, some way to help get these kids, let us know. We will try and provide some transportation. I know we got a lot of people. Um, I work at a car dealership. We can get some cars. That is not a problem. So uh, we can certainly do that if we need to. But uh, if you are able and you have some kids in your area, I'm sure, and you can, it's an easy sell. Because you tell the parents, hey, I'm going to take your kids away for about two and a half, three hours, and you can do whatever you want to. And you know what they're going to do? Take them. Take my kids. Here. <laughs> take my kids. That's kind of what happens. You guys are giggling, but you know what it's like. Yeah. yeah. Get, rid of, get rid of your kids for a little bit. You know, you need a break. And this, this is a great opportunity. Um, so we're trying things a little bit different. We're not doing a vacation Bible school, although it somewhat is. It's uh, art and sports camp. So the two sports we're going to be playing are soccer and basketball. And some of the girls came over yesterday and got some art projects all prepared. Um, going to be a great, great, great week. We've already got several kids um, that actually don't attend this church already uh, um, uh, put a reservation in online, which is very encouraging. You know, that stuff is fantastic. They're going to also be announcing it on uh, um, the local radio station, local uh, Christian radio station, 88.5, telling everybody about our, uh, telling all <laughs> Telling about, <clears throat> Listen, I'm excited. You guys are you know, happy to be here today. This, you need to bring Austin more up. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, he's got it going on. We need to hear a couple amens though every once in a while. So right. that would be, you got it. We got, uh, we do have a couple birthdays. So Anna has a birthday on the 21st, which is tomorrow, and then Gregory has a birthday on the 23rd, which is which is a fantastic deal. So. Uh, um, you know, reach out to them on their birthdays. That's that is a great, great thing to do. Does anybody in here have anything? You have is your birthday not on here? Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, Lauren's Lauren's is tomorrow. I why don't you guys be that enthusiastic? So we should be keeping that one. Oh, I I promise you, my son-in-law will embarrass her. <laughs> Singing happy birthday to her when she's down at camp. There is no question about that. But Lauren also has a birthday. Uh, she did inform me I was wrong by a year. She will be 15 tomorrow. So that is a good, scary to think you're going to be driving soon. Extremely scary. Thank you for reminding me, Austin. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to uh, talk about this morning? Any announcements? Anything that I may have missed? No. Okay. So... Obviously, with it being Father's Day, you know, my dad is not um, on this earth anymore. And, and some of you are in the same position as me. And it's, I'm not sad about it because I know where my dad is. And it's one of those things here, however many years God gives me, I get to spend eternity with, with God as well as my dad. So I'm not, not worried about that at all. It's kind of like he's on a, well, I would say vacation, but he's having the time of his life. I mean, he, it doesn't even equate to vacation right now. He's uh, in, in paradise. I mean, I don't know how you even compare that to um, what, we, what we experience here even on our best day. But there are a couple things I would like to point out. Turn my glasses on so I can actually read. Okay, so dealing with fathers. This kind of stuck out to me today because it actually came up on my daily devotional today. It's from Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Now, the cool part about it is here in our church, we've got some kids right there that, that are 100% blessed because of some of the fathers and the, uh, the, Christian, the Christian fathers that they do have. Now, the other thing I'd like to share... Everybody knows when I say God is, well, he's good, but what it starts with an L and ends with an of. Love. Hey, thank you. God is love, right? God is love. So if you use this as a math equation, God equals love. Now, Wellington shared this with us a couple weeks ago when he actually spoke. But when you think about this, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this a little bit different way. So I'm going to substitute God for the word love. 
And once again, this has to do with the fathers that, that are, are Christian fathers. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have God, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal, which I take a little bit of offense to that, but I'm okay. I'm going to be okay because it's in the Bible. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have God, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have God, I gain nothing. God is patient. God is kind. If I do not, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for giving us this day, Lord. Thank you so much for the, the just great fathers and, and men that we have as examples in here, Lord. We are truly blessed to have them um, at this church, Lord, and, and serving you. We appreciate everything that you've done for us today, and we appreciate everything that you have planned for us today, Lord. We love you. Help this to be just an incredible service today, Lord, and be uplifting to each other and uplifting to those that are watching online. Lord, we love you so very much. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good morning. It's nice to see each and every one of you here this morning to worship. <laughs> I'm excited this morning to get to worship with my dad and just wanted to once again thank you all of to all of the fathers here and what you've meant to your families and to us as a church family as well and just like to invite each of you to stand and sing together with us as we worship this morning.
am thy fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Calls for songs of boundless praise. Teach me song upon it, Mount of God, redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. How many of you have heard of Horatio Spafford? Um, I hadn't until I started looking into a little bit of the history of our next song that we're going to sing, uh, It Is Well. Um, he was a businessman that uh, lived back in the 1800s um, in Chicago with his wife, and he had five kids. Um, he had some tragedy uh, happen uh, early on in his life. Um, where his business was based in Chicago and through the Chicago fires lost a large portion of his business. Um, shortly uh, around that same time in about 1871, he also lost his young son uh, to pneumonia. And uh, so a lot of hard hardships that he had to deal with in his life. Um, a couple of years later, uh, his wife and daughters, and he was also a uh, planning to go along as well, they scheduled a uh, trip from America to uh, France. They bought uh, tickets on this uh, ocean liner to travel. Uh, he was unable to go with them uh, due to some business conflicts, and so he sent his wife and his four daughters along um, ahead of him. Um, but on the, the journey there, the ship ended up having trouble and ended up sinking, and a large portion of the the passengers were lost. Um, and in the, uh, the ones that were lost were his four young daughters. Um, and his wife managed somehow through a miraculous rescue to be able to be saved. He immediately booked passage on the next uh, ship that was making the voyage over. And um, just not knowing what was gonna, he was going to face on the other side just to be with his wife and just to to be together, and as he was traveling, the captain of the ship called his attention to the point to where they thought that the ship had went down, and, um, and he wrote these words, it is well, it is well with my soul, and just the testimony of that, just, you know, we can't wrap our, our minds around it, the world cannot explain that kind of a peace, 
but we can explain it because we have the Holy Spirit with us, and that is the only way that you have peace like that. And, and I don't know what you've had going on in your, your uh, life this week. I know some people's weeks have not been super easy, but we do have that peace that I hope at the end of the week you can say, it is well with my soul.
by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. turn to the book of James. James chapter 1 is where we're going to be starting. Okay. It's going to be a long message. Uh, (laughs) I love you guys too. I still remember the day I became a father. We adopted a six-year-old girl. And suddenly I was legally and morally obligated to be her father. The judge made very clear that that was the case. Biology had absolutely nothing to do with it. 
And while our daughter had no biological connection to me, she was in all aspects my daughter. She still is, to this very day, my daughter. In all ways that matter, that's who she is. When it comes to fatherhood, though, I know I was not well prepared for the role. I didn't really think about what I should be doing as a father, I have to admit. Uh, My own father was a hardworking, blue-collar man. He provided for us, although, to be honest, we never had a lot. But we never went hungry, either. We always had clothes, and we always had a roof over our head. He loved to hunt and fish and taught me how to do those things. He taught me how to work hard and taught me about integrity and how our word to another man should always be kept. However, to be quite honest, he also taught me a lot of other things that weren't so helpful. Mainly because he wasn't a Christian at the time. So if being a father is not about biology and it's not about teaching your kids how to hunt and fish or how to work hard, what is it about? Well, fatherhood's best example is, of course, our Heavenly Father, God. And so if you would please stand in, <clears throat> in honor of God's word, let me read to you from James chapter 1, verse 17. And we're going to start with this. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And so, Father, we ask you, Lord, to help us today to understand what it means to be a father. Lord, I know I'm speaking predominantly to the men here, but I pray, Lord, that you will also speak to everyone here, that, Father, as we go through this, they will see the need in their own life for you as a father in their life. But also, Lord, especially to us men, that we will understand that our role as a father has nothing to do with biology and everything to do with following your example. So help us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So the proper attitude, the first thing I want us to understand about fatherhood is this. It's the attitude of a father. You can be a father to somebody and not be biologically connected to them. Um, In in some ways, you know, Bree and Lauren, uh, there's a lot of men in this church that kind of act almost like your fathers. Um, We kind of watch over you, okay? And, And that's right, and that's proper to do so, to have the attitude of fatherhood even over somebody you're not biologically connected to. And... James here says that the the gifts that that he talks about, the father giving, first of all, you know, so the proper attitude of a father has to be one of giving. That has to be the the attitude that we have as fathers. Our first and foremost attitude ought to be, what can I give? What can I give to my family? What can I give to my, my spouse? What can I give to my children of myself? And James here says that, you know, the gifts that God gives, first of all, he says they're good. Now, I like giving good gifts, but this word here actually means useful or beneficial. Now, my wife is not an auto mechanic. Okay, she's not an auto mechanic. So buying her a torque wrench for, for a gift would not be very helpful. My, my daughter is not an, uh, you know, she, she's not a carpenter. So buying her a stud finder for the walls, well, actually that might be helpful because she calls me every time she has to drill a hole in her wall so that I can bring my stud finder over to find the studs in the wall. Okay. <clears throat> but the thing is, what, what God has given to us and what we as men have to seek to do with those In our lives, we have to seek to give good gifts, useful and beneficial. And if it's not useful, if it's not beneficial, if it doesn't accomplish something good in their lives, then why are we giving it? Now, let me ask you a question. What is the most beneficial gift 
you could ever give to your children. Jesus. Good answer. Austin, from one of our young teenagers here. That's the best gift you can give to your children. Jesus. I mean, you could leave, you could leave them a, a billion dollars, and if they didn't know Jesus, what good would it do? You could leave them the biggest house on the block, but if they don't know Jesus, what good does it do? You can buy them all the fanciest clothes, the fanciest phones, the fanciest cars, whatever you want to do, but if you don't give them Jesus, what good are you doing? So, so here's my first challenge for us as men. The thing we have to give to our children and to our families is this knowledge and experience of who Jesus Christ is. Secondly, James says that a good father, the good father, gives perfect gifts, complete and whole, not leaving anything out, everything that is needed, in other words. And so I, I would encourage you, uh, you know, and this is a challenge to myself because, like I said, while my daughter may be getting ready to turn 30, oh my goodness, this is 2021, 20, 86, 35. My daughter's going to turn 35 this year. Wow. Man, that means I'm getting old. <coughs> She's going to turn 35 this year. The best gift I can still give her is still a knowledge and experience of who Jesus Christ is. That's the best gift I think we could ever hope to give to our children. We can teach them about life, and we should. You know, life skills and things like that. We, we ought to teach our children those kinds of things about how to live day by day. Um, just as an example, I can remember when I was teaching my daughter how to drive. One of the things I made her learn how to do was change a flat tire. I made her learn how to do it. I took her out in the driveway, and we took a tire off of the car, and she had to learn how, and actually at that point, I had a little Ranger pickup that she was learning to drive, and so she had to learn how to drop that spare tire out from underneath the bed of the Ranger pickup, how to jack the, the, the pickup up and get the old tire off and put the new tire on. I made her do it, and that was a good thing for me to do, I think, as a dad, but if she doesn't know Jesus, what good does it do? Congratulations, you can now change a flat tire if you get stranded on the side of the highway. But if you don't have Jesus in your life, where, where are you going? So we ought to teach our children about life, but that's not the most important thing we can teach them about. We can teach them how to play sports and games, and, and, and we should teach them how to enjoy life. But if we don't teach them about Jesus, what good are we doing? What good will life skills do if they have no knowledge of their own need for a Savior and the availability of that Savior, known as Jesus. What good will skills at sports or games be if our children never learn about the love and grace of God that is available by knowing Jesus? You see, the, the good and perfect gift, as far as I'm concerned, is Jesus. That's the good and perfect gift. Because it's definitely beneficial. And it's certainly complete. So if I leave Jesus out, I'm going to be in trouble. So that's the attitude of a father. The attitude of a father, I believe, comes right from there. It's this desire to give good and perfect things to our families. Then secondly, we have to take a look at the actions of a father. What does a father do? I mean, it's one thing to have the attitude, but now you have to do something. And, it, and back in the book of Matthew... Um, Matthew chapter 6 is an amazing chapter to me because over and over and over and over again, Jesus talks about the Father in Matthew chapter 6. In verses 26 through 32, he says this, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Now, I understand you may be going, okay, preacher, where are you going with this? Let me try and connect the dots here. The attitude or the actions of a father are this. A father provides for his children. A father provides for his children. You know, I I love this because, you know, Jesus starts off with the example of the birds, right? And here's the thing about a bird. A bird has no concept of yesterday, today, or tomorrow. They have no concept of past. It's only the moment that exists for a bird. And there's probably not much future either. Everything is instinct-driven, pretty much. Um, But they don't build a big storehouse alongside the nest. They build the nest, they lay the eggs, the eggs hatch. Depending upon the species of bird, mother, father, sometimes both, go out and provide the food that the, that the little baby birds need. But they don't build the storehouse next to it saying, you know what, we're going to have little baby birds in here pretty soon. We better fill this storehouse up so that our baby birds will have something to eat. They just don't have that concept. And yet God takes care of them. Parents, let me tell you something. Your kids have no concept of future. They just don't. All they know is the moment, which is why kids, young people, often make really, really, how do I put this delicately, stupid decisions. Oh, I'm sorry. They make poor decisions. Because... As a young person, and I was like this, and so were you. As a young person, you don't think about tomorrow. All you think about is today. And the good father says, you know what? I need to provide for my children today, but I better think about tomorrow for them as well, because they're not. Not yet. And that's what God does. He takes care of them today, but he's also thinking about them tomorrow. He's he's planning ahead for them. So the good father has to be willing to work in such a way to provide for his children, not only today, but tomorrow as well. And oh, by the way, this idea, and I I saw this meme, I think back on around Mother's Day, actually. It it was funny. Um, This idea that once your child turns 18, you know, just let them go. Good luck with that attitude. Like I said, my daughter's going to turn 35. And you know what happens if my daughter calls me up in the middle of the night and says, Daddy, I need you? I'm not going to tell her, well, you know what, honey? You're over 18. So suck it up, buttercup, and go handle it yourself. You're not my responsibility anymore. You're an adult. No, no. my daughter is still my daughter. And she calls me up in the middle of the night and says, Daddy, I need you. Guess what? I'm getting up out of bed, and I'm getting dressed, and I'm going to go see what she needs. Because my responsibility as a father doesn't end just because she's become an adult. And so, dads, we have to do this, you know, and and I love how Jesus talks about, you know, he feeds. He says, God, the father feeds the birds. He provides for their nourishment. And, And that's what we have to do. We have to provide for our children's nourishment. And that's just not physical nourishment. That's also mental and emotional nourishment and spiritual nourishment. Because we are not just physical beings, we are also emotional beings and we are also spiritual beings. And dads, if we don't take that responsibility seriously to feed all three areas of our children's lives, our children are going to grow up stunted a little bit. Now again, I'm, you know, my dad was, he was a good man. And don't, don't take this as me saying that he, that anything less than that. 
but I'm not sure I can remember too many times that, that my dad looked at me and said, son, I love you. I just don't remember that many times of him saying it. I knew he did, but it was never really expressed openly. You ask my daughter what happens every time we separate, every time she goes away, you know, if she comes over to see me, you ask my daughter what happens. I'm going to hug her neck, I'm going to kiss her cheek, and I'm going to tell her she, that I love her every single time. I want her to know my love never stops. She's going to be 35, and I still hug her, and I still kiss her cheek, and I still tell her I love her. Because I want to feed that emotional side of her that is necessary to be fed. And she's pretty much providing for her own physical needs, which is, as an adult, I would hope she would do. But her spiritual and her emotional needs, I, I still take, I, I, those are still on me, I think, to help nourish her and feed her in those areas. And at the end, you know, what Jesus says here, right? Your heavenly father knows that you need them all. You see, in dads, this is one of the things that we really have to work on. We've got, to, we've got to work on knowing what our children need. Not just what they want. It's easy to give our kids what they want because they'll tell you what they want. But what they want isn't always what they need. So we've got to work on that. So the best actions of a father are directed at caring for his children, I believe, both today and tomorrow, providing for them. <clears throat> I mean, really, you know, if you think about it, too, and I know for some of us, you know, it was longer ago than others, but think back to when you were a child. I'll give you a moment, because like I said, for some of you, it's longer, and so it's going to take you longer to get back that far. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing of it is, Austin, while you say it's not long, it doesn't take you long to get back to the memories of a child, you're growing up. <laughs> so we'll, 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 one of these days we'll talk about that. <laughs> the best part about being a child is what? I didn't have to worry about tomorrow. Right? I mean, isn't that what the best part about being a child really is? I don't have to worry about tomorrow. What's going to be on the, on the table tomorrow for food? I don't have to worry about that. That's mom and dad's problem. What am I going to wear tomorrow? I don't know. Mom and dad will work it out. Do I have a place to sleep? Mom and dad. Hey, I've got a baseball game i got to go to. Mom, dad. Right? I mean, that's, you, know, you think about it. Being a child is kind of fun. At least it's supposed to be. Because the child doesn't have to care about tomorrow, and they shouldn't have to, I don't think. Now, at some point, they need to be trained that, yes, they need to, when they're ready to face that. But the best part about being a child is that you don't have cares for tomorrow. And the actions of a father, I think, must always be aimed at meeting the needs of his family, of his children, covering both today and tomorrow. And the father who fails to do this is a poor father. Remember, we said the, the actions of a father to provide for his children, the attitude of the father is one of giving. And what that means then is a father has to be willing to sacrifice. A father has to be willing to give up some of what he wants for the sake of his family so they can have what it needs. Hard work. It is. Being a dad is hard. And oh, by the way, as I said, I think in, my, in the bulletin there, uh, it's not getting easier in today's generation to be a father. It's not, being, it's not getting easier to be a grandfather. We have to be willing to give up our own pleasure for their needs. The reward is knowing that what we're doing is following the example of our Heavenly Father, who even though the creatures that he created have no care for tomorrow, he still does. And he provides for them both today and tomorrow. So hopefully your, your actions match this example, dads. Caring for the needs of our children and our families. 
So that's what the attitude is. That's what the actions are. And here's the third component of being a father. And again, it has nothing to do with biology. It's simply, Dad, are you available? Are you available to your child? In Psalm 121, verse 4, the psalmist says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. <laughs> and there's times when as a dad, I think I felt like I've, never, I've not slumbered nor sl- slept nearly enough. You see, the Father is available. You know, our Heavenly Father is always available, right? 24-7, 365, 366 in the leap years. Our Heavenly Father is always available. And a father, as a father, I have to be available when my child needs me. Now, I can't go without sleep forever. Um, I know our teenagers have tried to go without sleep for an entire day. They warned me that I might have to yell at them a little bit this morning just to kind of keep them awake. Uh, this is their tradition. Before they head off to camp, they stay awake for the whole day. They don't. So that's kind of why maybe they've been a little bit different this morning. But I know I can't do that. But when I look at the meaning of the words in the Hebrew of slumbering and sleeping, there's something here that comes into me that still pay, makes me think about it. You know, the, the psalmist says that the God of Israel neither slumbers. He doesn't slumber. And that word slumber in the Hebrew, there, there's part of it that it talks about being drowsy and inattentive. And we cannot be inattentive when it comes to our kids. We've got to pay attention to them, to what they're going through, to how they're responding to the things of the world around them. You know, these last 18 months, if they've taught us nothing else, it's that our world can change overnight. And as stressful as that has been on us as adults, and it has been, don't think that it hasn't affected the children as well. We have to pay attention to them. And, and that word sleep, there, there's an inference in there, and, and it's not the primary definition of the word, because the primary definition of the word is to close your eyes and go to sleep. But there's an inference inside the Hebrew here that talks about being lazy. It's not caring. And we can't let ourselves get there. See, as a dad, I have to be available for my child. I can't go without sleep forever, but I can lose sleep when I have to. You see, I've got to make my family enough of a priority that I'll give up what I want for what they need. Now, I have to admit, <coughs> pardon me, I missed some pretty important things in my daughter's life when I was in the military. I wasn't there. I wasn't there, and I couldn't even call her. Um, the, the, the days of calling from the ship to shore, and I, know some, and I don't know how, how it works today because I have not been on a, on a naval ship in over 20 years, and certainly none of the really modern ones, uh, but back in my day, <clears throat> if we were out to sea, you wrote a letter. No, 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 no. You wrote a letter, and you put it into the, there was a mail drop right there. In fact, you had, a, you had what was, uh, on the larger ships, you actually had, there was a special rating called Postal Clerk, and they dealt with the mail on board the ship. They would package it up. And the next time you'd get a helicopter over from the aircraft carrier, they'd hook up the mailbag to it, and it would take it over to the aircraft carrier, and they'd fly it off the aircraft carrier to a, to a land station somewhere, and it would get processed through a military post office. And eventually, if everything went well, it would get home. But let me tell you, if I had to, you know, if my daughter's having an event today, I'm not talking to her today if I'm out to sea. And I miss some of those, and I know that. 
So, sweetheart, if you're watching, I'm sorry. But I know this. When I could be there, I tried. And that's the best we can do sometimes, is try to be there. You know, the idea of service to the Lord has often been characterized by this saying, God doesn't care about our abilities. He is concerned about our availability. And perhaps the same is true of our families. Maybe our ability as a father is not nearly as important as our availability to our family. Being available is often inconvenient. Being available often requires sacrifice. Now, I know I was never a father of the year candidate, okay? Um, I'm not saying I was a bad dad, okay? I'm not saying, I'm just saying I never got, I never got nominated as father of the year, all right? That's all that means. It, it doesn't mean I was a bad dad, so don't, don't, don't think I'm saying that. And if I had to do it over again, if I could go back, I would adjust some of my parenting tactics, And one of the ones I would adjust the most is I would make myself a lot more available. All right, let's bring this to a close. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, the Apostle Paul has a directive to fathers, a commandment. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Do not provoke your children to anger. <clears throat> um, so, let me, let, me, let me say something about this for just a moment. Dads, have you ever gotten into a discussion with your children and your children have gotten angry? Who was wrong? <clears throat> and I would like to say that in those times when I've gotten into discussions with my daughter that she got angry that it was her fault her problem not mine but I also know there were times in my life as a dad that anger was my response to her and that provoked her as well Rather, Paul says, rather than provoking your children to anger. So the, what, my first point here is, is simply this as we conclude this. Don't provoke your children. Don't make your children angry. And especially if you are already angry, dads, let me give you a piece of, of kind advice. If you find yourself angry with one of your children, go to a quiet corner. Put your nose in the middle of the corner and start praying. Don't look at anybody. Don't talk to anybody but God. All right? Because if you're already angry and you're trying to deal with, yeah, you got a problem. You need to just get, the, get rid of the anger first. So here's my kind advice to all of you, to myself included. If you find yourself getting angry, go put yourself in a corner, put your nose deep into that corner and start talking to God about why you're angry. When you're done with that, then maybe we can step out and start talking to our children and start giving them discipline, training and education teaching them how to respond to, to life. And instruction. And that word in the Greek is so interesting because it means to give cautionary advice, to warn of danger. There are things that your kids are going to think about doing, think about getting involved with, that they don't understand the danger of them. And we're not supposed to provoke our children to anger as we talk about them. We're supposed to give them cautionary advice. <clears throat> and I would just remind you again, the attitude to give good and perfect gifts and the best and most perfect gift you can give is that of Jesus. Focus on Jesus because that's what your kids need more than anything else. I know it's easy for anger to be our first response when our children don't behave as we desire them to behave. Okay, maybe not for you. It is for me, all right? I'm just total transparency here. I get mad. I have a temper. And like I said, if I could go back and do things over, yeah, there's some parenting tactics I would change. 
It's hard to remember that these little humans, which is what they are, are going through an amazing process as they mature. And they aren't fully capable of making rational decisions. In fact, some psychologists suggest that human beings are not capable of full rational thought until about the age of 25. So don't expect your kids to make full rational thought and processes. If we're totally honest, even as mature adults, we have a hard time sometimes making full rational decisions. Thank you. At least I got one amen. <clears throat> okay, and I got a couple nods to the head. Good. I was worried that, again, I was talking about myself, and it didn't apply to anybody else. And it's so easy to let, our, let anger drive our responses with our spouses, with our children. And I think we need to be equally careful with that. Being a father and a husband is demanding. And it's, again, not a matter of biology. It's a matter of attitude, action, and availability as to whether or not you're going to be successful at it or whether or not I'm going to be successful at it. Our example is good, right? We have a good father, our heavenly father. We just have to learn to follow him. I know that I won't be perfect at it, but I would challenge you, let's be better tomorrow than we were today. You see, in Christ, we can be better husbands and better fathers. We are not going to be as good as our Heavenly Father, but we can be better. And so I'd encourage you to consider that as we move forward. God bless you, men. Happy Father's Day. But seek to be better fathers tomorrow, better husbands tomorrow. Our families need it. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, for the time that you've brought us together here, for the opportunity we've had to, to spend time together in your word and to, to hear from you. And Lord, we do consider your word to be true and to be that which is best for us. And so help us, Lord, as we go forth from here to become better, to listen to you better, to follow your example better, so that, Lord, in all of this, we can be the men that we need to be in your church, in our communities, in our businesses, wherever we might be, that we can be a better man tomorrow than we are today. Thank you, Lord, for this. Ask you again, Lord, to use this now to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand as we sing this song together.
Before we are dismissed, I want to ask our teams to come down that are going to camp this week. We want to have a word of prayer with them. That they would be sent off properly. Uh-oh, where's Lauren? Alex is also going to Signs Alex and Wonders camp this week. Yeah, she's going to a camp this week too, just not the same <laughs> one, right? Yep. I want us to have, I want to have, like I said, just a word of prayer. <clears throat> it's all right. We'll wait. So, let's pray for these, that the Lord would watch over them, protect them, and guide them during this time. Father, as we come to you, we do give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for our teenagers, for our young people, Lord, that are here. Lord, they are a blessing to us, a blessing to your church. They are the future of your church, and we thank you for them. We thank you for ours, the ones here that call Central home. For Austin and Lauren and Brianna and for Alex, Lord, for all of them. As they're going to be going to camp this week, Lord, we would ask first physical protection uh, as they travel. That, Lord, you would just watch over them. That you would make sure that those that are driving are in good shape and that the vehicles are in good shape. That, Father, that nothing of harm would come to them in that way. And then, Lord, when they get there to camp, <clears throat> we just ask you, Father, to, to kind of take away all the distractions all those things that maybe they're worried about, concerned about, scared about, whatever it is, that you would take those away from them right now even, but especially when they step on the campus of, of wherever they're going for their camp, that you would give them, Lord, a calm spirit, that your peace would be there with them, and that, Lord, they would open their hearts, open their minds, open their ears to hear your voice, that those that will be speaking will be empowered by your Holy Spirit to speak the words that these young people need, and that, Lord, they will respond. Soften their hearts, even now, today. Remind them, Lord, of how many people love them and how many people are cheering for them, even as they go off to camp this week. Give to them, Lord, a good week. Give to them, Lord, good and perfect gifts, we ask. You said that that's what you give, and we trust you to do that in their lives. So we thank you for this. Give to them, Lord, what they need, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys, and you are dismissed. Thank you this morning.